name is Michael Brüsset. I'm a healthcare solutions engineer. Welcome to this session, which is about handling of time series data with Iris for Health and healthcare. And um, feel free to ask questions if there is anything, or we can do a little Q&A at the end of this. So, a little agenda. We're looking into um, the problem first, so I'll do a little problem analysis, and then I'm going to present you a solution approach that we found uh, for our German customers for a couple of projects where we're in the moment in the process of implementing and finding out what to do with it, actually. And I'll do a little live demo here, and then there will be room for some questions and answers, actually. So what's the problem? When we're treating patients in a hospital, then the doctor typically sees the patient, does the treatment, and documents what they do in a hospital information system in an electronic health record, uh, which is a manual process, basically. So it's, it's not very fast, you know, some people need to type in stuff. Um, whereas if we're attaching sensors to a patient, maybe if somebody is on an intensive care unit, then data is uh, recorded on an ongoing basis. So we have data streams coming um, over time with large amounts of data which is typically captured by some sort of special system like a critical care system and the like, monitoring stuff. And um, then it sits there until somebody looks at it and says, okay, here it's final, and then we can transfer those results over to the electronic health record. And from there, it will eventually be fed over to our um, health share product. So that could be a broadcast, could be ETL, whatever it is. So that's what normally happens when we're uh, dealing with uh, data here in these cases. Now, um, what we learned from some of our customers in Germany that they would actually be interested in accessing the, the raw data that goes into the monitoring systems directly for various purposes. And um, so we've been trying to find out what that is. So they approach us and say, hey, we're interested in looking at this data for a variety of reasons. And um, that could be just viewing for individual patients, that could be an, uh, analytics, that could be research, and so on. Right? Um, the problem is that the actual use cases are often not very well defined, if at all. So sometimes they say, hey, we just want to have that data available so we can do whatever we want at a later point in time. So basically, it's store it now, ask questions later, what, they, what they're trying to do here. Okay. And, um, the problem that we see that uh, time series data, so data that comes in continuously, that has a start, it, then it goes on for a while, we never know when it will stop. It could be just a couple of days worth of data, it could be a year worth of data. We don't know upfront, right? So traditional analytics approaches are not perfectly uh, fitted for analyzing this type of data because they have problems um, looking at the temporal aspects that's in the data itself. And calculating an average heart rate apparently doesn't make much sense. So what we're actually interested in is finding correlations and changes over time uh, in heart rates, maybe versus medications that have been given to a patient. Right, so that's, imagine, or think of it, if you're trying to do that in SQL, doing sliding windows, time windows on the data, that's not so easy to do. Right? So that's why we're having a little problem to solve here. And, um, Part of the reason that our customers cannot tell us what, they, what the actual use cases are up front is that they say, Man, maybe this is for research purposes. So researchers typically, they wanna have, to, wanna have a look at the data, they wanna play with it, and uh, whatever they'll find, they put it in a model, and then we can use that model and apply it to the real-time data and see what's, what's the use of that. Right, so that's the actual problem here. So on a more technical level, what does that mean? Let's look at some key characteristics of uh, time series data, what we're talking about here. So a patient is attached to sensors, and those sensors deliver data either directly to the next system in the chain or to a device which services many, many sensors. And uh, what can happen here is that we might have overlaps in, the, in these data streams or we might have gaps. Imagine a sensor falls off the patient, has to be reattached. You know, then we have a series of values, then we have a gap, and then we have another series of values, which is apparently for the same patient, it's for the same type, but um, over time there's a little, little gap in here. Or if you have a patient that's um, been treated for a long time, 
chances are that the device has to be changed. Maybe the patient is moved to another bed, there's another device, and um, so that means that we're having a different data source all of a sudden, which captures the same type of values for the same person, and then we need to deal with that somehow. So um, what's the key characteristics here? The, the, uh, the data is collected automatically. Um, the frequency can be very high, and just to get this out of the way, we're not talking about audio data or video data here, but for like individual measurements. So, so that's why I'm saying, I keep saying time series data here. What can happen with that? We might see erroneous values, like mismeasurements or those gaps that I mentioned. Um, typically, this would be treated in the monitoring system that's attached to those um, patients. So somebody would be looking at this and say, hey, a heart rate of 500 doesn't make sense. Just take out this value. You know? so, but if we're capturing the data in real time, more or less, then we'll see these values and we need to deal with this. Um, talking about metadata, so the patient identifier, of course, or the patient identity is, is some sort of metadata. So we know what data this uh, was, the data collected for, for which patient. Um, we might not have that if we see sensor data directly. So maybe we need to deal with this. Maybe the data comes through a device and the device uh, gives us the, uh, some metadata, but that's not always the case. And another thing that um, when we're talking to our customers in Germany, they mentioned how, um, how can I make sure that I can delete this erroneous value that I talked about earlier? That might be not so simple because sometimes those data points that we get do not have individual identifiers. So then we need to find a way of how to addressing finding this, uh, these so we can deal with it. And um, talking of metadata, we have um, put some thought in what would be interesting. And some of this, again, comes from our customers. Uh, some of them said, hey, we would be interested in seeing, is there a bias um, between firmware versions, for instance, me measuring certain um, values, right? So we need to collect this type of data. And so a very simple model we see here is that for the data that's collected automatically, we, of course, want to know what patient it is. Maybe we want to know what encounter that is. And, and of course, we want to know what type of sensor and maybe what sort of device and what's the firmware running on that device, what's the vendor of this uh, device if we're having a whole variety typically here so that we can, uh, researchers can actually identify uh, differences and biases in this data. And as I said, this might not be available all the time. Talking about delivery, how do we get this data? So when we're talking about time series, uh, we would expect that we have a start, then we have a number of values coming in, and at some point, eventually, it's going to stop. Um, so, but we do not always see it like that. So sometimes we get this continuous stream, sometimes we get the data in chunks, let's say once per day, depending on the system that provides us the data. Or we get it as a bulk. So once the patient treatment is done, then we get an export of the data, so we get like three weeks of data in one go. So we need to deal with this. And if we're getting data in chunks, so one issue is that we need to make sure that we're retrieving or processing it in the right order so that we do not have problems in that area. And the data itself, uh, it, it highly depends on what uh, sensors is collecting this data and how they are transmitted. So sometimes we get a value on a timestamp. That's the, the easiest because then we know exactly at what time the value was captured. Sometimes we get a value plus an offset. So we have a start point in time and then we get some values and each value has an offset attached to it. Or we have just equidistant values without any timestamps. So we get a measurement every five seconds and then we have to assign the timestamp to those values ourselves. Right, so that is something that you need to be aware of. Talking of data volume, um, we did some simple math here. Um, so let's say you have a patient that's in the ICU for a long time and uh, we're taking a measurement every five minutes that would accumulate to a lot of values. And uh, then the question is, what is a good way, what is a meaningful way of dealing with this uh, amount of data? And uh, when we're going down to measurements every five seconds and we have easily millions of data points for a single patient, right? Just one given type of value. So that accumulates quickly if you're having ma many sensors, many values that you wanna measure and many patients here. So compare this to normal clinical data processing in healthcare, what do we do? 
I mentioned before, the, the patient is treated by a doctor, the doctor documents what he's doing, that's a manual process, more or less. So data gets entered into the EHR, and from there we retrieve it in a health share where we can then use it. Use it means we can view it on a per patient basis, we can analyze it using Health Insight, for instance, or we can like share it with other uh, types of software like statistic tools and so on. So that's the normal way what we do. So compare this again to the um, automatic data, uh, automatically captured data. Um, then, as I said, we have the problem. The data is continuously, we don't know when it's going to stop. So we have a start, we have those values, and it's coming in potentially very fast. Right? Uh, the, the issue is it's captured in some other system, as I've shown before. And uh, typically only the final results, not the reading itself, are provided to HR. And that compares pretty much to what we see in radiology department. You know, some radiologists looking at the picture, writes a report, the report is what we see. Maybe we get a JPEG image as a copy so somebody is interested and can look at it, but that wouldn't typically be the, the full radiology study that we, that we have. And the same applies to this type of data, of course. So we have a couple of options what we can do on a technical level with this in HR. And these options include like we can like feed it as any other clinical data into our SDA data model. That would be one way. But then keep in mind, if that's six million um, data points per patient, um, that's quite a chunk. And the other option would be to treat it just like a radiology image, just take it as a, some, some sort of document or a blob and store that in HealthShare's SDA. That's also an opportunity, but that uh, doesn't let us do analytics on it very easily because if data is hidden in those documents or blobs, then you have to get it out of it to do analytics on it. And so then the next choice would be uh, don't store it in SDA at all, store it somewhere else and link it. Right? And that was actually the, uh, the idea for our solution approach here. So um, we thought, why not combine the power of Iris for Health with that of HR? So basically, we feed those data streams, those time series data into Iris for Health in some very simple data structure that's good enough for doing analytics on it, and then just register each time series in HR. So instead of sending the individual values over, just say, hey, here is a time series for that patient. It starts here and it has heart rate readings, for instance. So then what would analytics look like or how, how could we use that data? Because we now have it in two different places. We need to think about how we're going to make it accessible. So the way is we are re registering the data in HealthShare. We can view the normal clinical data in the clinical viewer as we are used to. And then we can actually uh, put a link in the clinical viewer that opens a little plugin viewer so, and that would display the, the time series data or do whatever is appropriate in, in that given scenario. Analytics-wise, that means that I can do my normal analytics with, let's say, Health Insight on the clinical data stored in HealthShare itself. And I can, from here, uh, from Iris for Health, I can feed the uh, time series data over to some specialized tools, like uh, there is uh, plugins for Python, for instance, that can do time series analytics. So that can do sliding windows and all, all these kinds of things. And uh, so this way we can provide the data to tools that are suitable for working with this type of data. And of course, we can also combine those time series then with data that is in HealthShare. Uh, that could be this, this error goes from HealthShare directly, but it could just as well come from Health Insight. So we have a lot of uh, um, options that we can use here. So, and that might help us to find all those hidden treasures that we have in the data. So, to summarize, we're registering, that's, that's the approach that we're implementing right now, right? So that's um, we're registering the time series, not the values. So it's one entry per time series in um, HealthShare. We use Iris for Health capabilities for high, um, high, uh, high performance in, in terms of ingesting and persisting data. And uh, then we have the opportunity to uh, implement some data cleansing here. So we can map the data that we collect in RS for Health to uh, patients. We can handle these overlaps and gaps that I mentioned before. Uh, we can enrich the metadata. All the issues that we have can be done in uh, this data model. And the reason I like this approach is that um, this makes it easy to adopt to the great variety that we see in requirements. 
because uh, every single customer I was talking to had different requirements, different types of data. Sometimes it's HL7, sometimes it's CSV files, sometimes it's something else. So that makes it a lot easier to handle this and keep that complexity from Hedger because all I have there is just a link and it doesn't matter what, what data source uh, hides behind this. And one thing that's optional, of course, is we could provide some sort of key image or key object. Again, this was stolen from the uh, risk packs uh, world. So if somebody says, hey, here is a value that I want to transmit to Hedger directly because it's important we want to have it there, then we can do that as well. And uh, the only thing that's necessary on, on the Hedger side actually is we need to customize the clinical viewer so that it gives us a link to those time series. And in this little demo that I'm going to do, uh, we're simply launching a, uh, a little web application on the iris side that gives us a display of the data. So the display of the data for, for this proof of concept that we're doing here, we built our own, but we could just as well um, use something that comes with vendors of uh, monitoring systems, for instance, um, or just link to their systems and use their viewers. So, so that's options. Um, we cannot say what's the best way here because as I said, the requirements are quite different between different customers. And the good thing is now we know what data we have, now we can make it also available to other tools. Um, these are those uh, specialized, uh, specialized time series analytics tools that I mentioned. So iris for health allows us, just to summarize this, easily handle a variety of input sources here. Um, all different protocols, are all different data formats. We can handle huge amounts of data, of course, and we can easily provide this data that we collected to third-party tools. So that makes it really easy to handle also changing requirements over time. So um, if we do that for a while, so we can actually handle that very good, especially if we don't know what we want to do with it. So we store it, put it there, and some, sometimes some researcher comes and does some playing with the data, we have it. Now, on the healthcare side, um, I mentioned there is nothing more to do than customizing the clinical viewer because what we're using here to represent those links to the time series is the built-in custom object that we have in SDA3. That's there, it's built-in, nothing to do. We can just simply use it. And uh, then we can customize the clinical viewer. There's a couple of steps that we need to do. And um, what I'm going to show you is the, the data model that we use at the moment to store the actual time series data. A little production that feeds that over. We're gonna look at that live, so it's too small to look at this. And how that works in the, in the clinical viewer. Um, just as a side note, this, the steps for the um, configuration of the clinical viewer, that's very well described in the online documentation. Um, so we basically, the, the main part to, to set this up securely is to manage the link between the clinical viewer and the um, pop-up custom viewer for, for the time series data. We're using um, OAuth here, so the federated single sign-on stuff between HealthShare and iris for health And um, then we can do this uh, for the purpose of this demonstration. I've also created a little uh, test data generator here so we can actually have some numbers. Uh, don't take these for real because it's just randomly generated them. So let's look at the live demo. Um, what I like is the approach of following the data. So we have in, on the iris for health side, I have this little simulator. That's the uh, TS devices namespace here, which is producing what I think I refer to as raw data over to a production that basically stores it. So that's the um, store for the actual time series. And then uh, sends a link over to an edge gateway in HealthShare, which is treat it just as any other piece of clinical information that we normally would process and make it available via the um, registry then so we can feed it out to the clinical viewer. Okay, so let me show you how that works. I have this virtual machine. This is set up with an instance of Iris for Health. It has an instance of Unified Care Record and the Clinical Viewer, of course. And um, let's start at the beginning. So we're looking at the generator for the clinical data. This is really quite simple. So in a, in a real world example, you would have some, I don't know, heart rate measuring device, a smartwatch, or some clinical device that's attached to the patient. So in, uh, this little sample here, 
I'm using a production that produces three types of values. We have a plot pressure, diastolic, systolic, and we have a heart rate. And to make this a little bit easier here for demonstration purposes, um, we can configure the metadata that's sent over. Uh, the most important piece here is, of course, the uh, patient identifier. So we know immediately what patient that is. And if you've seen a couple of health share demonstrations from an assistance, you might know Marla Gonzalez. That's her patient identifier. And of course, we have also some other information here. Um, one thing I'd like to point out is uh, the loin code of that type of measurement so we know what it is, which um, is important if we want to display this properly. So what happens here, this is um, using two different time windows. So these two are generating data in 10 second intervals. The heart rate is simulated in five second intervals. So continuously generating data here, sending it over to a business operation, which then feeds it to the actual time series handling uh, namespace. So if you look at the data that's generated, that's actually quite simple. We used a uh, sim very simple structure and you can see patient data, you see the metric identifying the, the time series actually. And we can see somewhere is the actual value. Where is it? Here. And again, this is just a sample. We're just generating test data. So I have something to show today. And then let's switch over to the namespace that uses this. And this is a production has, uh, that's doing two things. One is processing on the inbound side the data that comes in and stores it away. And then the other one is that feeds it over to HealthShare as uh, if there is a, is a new link, basically. So let's look at the first one, the incoming data. It comes in on a TCP from the, from the other namespace. And it does nothing else than store it. It stores it in this data model that I mentioned before. And the data model that we're using here, it's somewhat, it's, it's work in progress actually, so it's probably going to change. But let's have a look at it anyway. Using the famous class explorer here to show the data structures. So as you can see, it's very simple. Here's a table that has the entries and there's a number of other tables that give us the uh, metadata, so here the identification of the metric and a link to the actual patient. Um, this is probably going to change. We have presented this to a couple of customers and um, having collecting their feedback and uh, recommendations, trying to put this on a little bit different uh, basis here, but it's basically, it will do, do the same thing. So once the data is stored and this is totally, the, the frequency this happens is totally depending on the rate we get the data. You know, so we have the, the 10 second, the five second interval that I mentioned before. So whenever data comes in, it gets stored here and that's it on the inbound side. And then there is another pathway um, where we feed the uh, link to the individual time series, series over to HealthShare. And normally it would be sufficient to do this once. So we get a new time series, we identify, okay, here is a new type of value measured for a new patient, for instance, that would be a trigger allowing us to say, hey, here is a new time series, create a link, send it over to HealthShare. Uh, we decided to do this on a continuous basis and uh, update the time series entry in HealthShare with some, some statistics. So uh, things like the number of values that have been measured, or we could attach other uh, indicators as well, like highest, lowest value and so on. So to give more information to the clinical viewer directly without the need to use a viewer to look at the data. So that's triggered by a business service. In this case, it's running every 30 seconds. Its only purpose is to trigger this business operation, which then does what I just said. I send over the update for the time series that goes uh, out to the edge gateway in HR. So if we look at that, and then we can also have a look at what's actually sent. In. So here is a typical edge gateway configuration and if you played with HealthShare and used the demo install, this might uh, look familiar here. The only thing that we've added basically is this guy. Um, it's a business service that's accepting SDA on uh, via TCP, not by file. 
So, and then it just feeds it into the normal processing pipeline, just stores it in the edge gateway, just as any other uh, type of clinical data here. And let's have a look at the content that comes over. I don't see it here very nicely, I afraid. But you can see this is uh, basically an SDA container for a patient uh, with number 6621224. And we have these custom objects in here. And these custom objects, as I said, represent the link to a time series. In this case, it's the time series that's identified by the number three, whatever that is. Um, it gives us information about what's in there, uh, heart rate in this case. And it gives us the entry count. And that updates frequently. So every 30 seconds, as I've con configured the business service, this is sent over. Um, in life use cases, it would probably be enough to do that in longer time intervals, but we send it here to, so we see something moving. Then. So that's basically it. The, the data comes in, it gets stored, um, so then it's available. And uh, we could actually have a look at the table that stores this. So I'm just looking at the uh, streamlet now, at the streamlet data that contains all this data. You can see here, again, this is the custom object that I have fed in that's stored in the table. So that's basically it. And this table doesn't have many entries here. It's basically one for every um, time series that we uh, received so far. And so that's, that's what it looks like, the custom object that's stored here in the streamlet table. And again, you can see entry count which gets updated and everything else remains static um, because it's basically only sent over once. Now, what can I do with this? Of course, I can look at the data and for this, let me go to the navigation app here and just search for Marla. And we see normal healthcare behavior. behavior here. We see all the data that we have fed in so far from Mala Gonzalez from the different sources or edge gateways. And then we can open this. And so the uh, configuration steps that we went through um, give us an extra tab over here. So we have the normal vital signs, which for some reason is empty here. Should be something in there. Anyway, we added this one saying vital sign time series. So and if we click on this, we do not get individual values. Instead, we get links to the time series that have been registered for Marla. So um, we can see the number of entries here. That should, should be updating continuously as data flows in. And you can see a link over here. And that, links, uh, that link points to a web application that actually lives on the iris for health instance. So if I click that, First of all, this is OAuth, so I have to go through security here. Um, actually, we left that in so we can actually show it. So what we see now is a very simple graph that give, give us the last, I don't know, 20, 15 something data points from that time series. And that will be updating, hopefully, every 30 seconds um, so that we can actually do something with this. So in this case, it's, it's really a very simple graph. So the, um, the web application that's running on the iris for health site is very easy. It's just using uh, eCharts, which is a, uh, an open source charting library. And as you can see here on the right, this is just, that's basically it. It's just a very simple application. And uh, my colleague Attila, who, who built this um, for our customers, uh, said the, the diffic most difficult part here was to set up the uh, OAuth security between the two. So writing this and getting the data in, that was actually quite easy. So, and that's um, basically it here on, on this side. Now, making the data available, that's the interesting question if we're talking about analytics, which would probably not be on individual patients, but on all sets of data. So one thing we can do from here is, of course, export it um, for instance, using these reports, uh, these exports here configured like the patient summary in SDA. And uh, in here, we should have the custom objects again. There it is. 
So that gives us a list of all the time series that have been registered for Marla Gonzalez in this case. And the display is not updating here. Uh, you can tell here from the custom object, so that should be four or five for the different time series that we have fed in so far. So we could use that on an individual patient basis to, to provide links to external tools that can then fetch it from iris for health or we can uh, point those tools, for instance, our embedded Python, um, directly to the uh, data, uh, to the tables that live in iris for health So let me switch back to my presentation here. So, as I said, what we did here is a proof of concept. We're currently in the process of uh, discussing this with our customers in Germany and some others as well, actually, um, to see what would be a good way. And what we see is that uh, requirements are really, really quite different. Some say, hey, I'm not interested in any data structures. Just store the data as it comes in. We'll do the rest. All we need to know is that it's there. That's how we can do it here. Um, others say, hey, it would be nice if the data would be consolidated into a mo uh, generic data model. So then uh, we have a, we're not working on a moving target if we're doing analytics. So we can focus on a single set of tables, for instance. Also done. Uh, one thing um, a customer suggested is maybe we can do two things. We can store the raw data that comes in as it comes in, in, in one namespace. And from there, convert it to the data model that I presented here. So we have it in two places. Of course, it would blow up in terms of uh, space requirements over time, but that would give them the most of it, basically. So they can look at the consolidated data model for easy analytics, and if they wanted to, they could actually go into the raw data and do uh, further analytics on uh, special findings uh, that were found, basically, here. Yeah, so. Um, but that, again, this is uh, highly dependent on what the uh, use cases are and what the requirements and the capabilities are in terms of storage. So. Uh, depending highly on the customer. Um, what we have not worked on so far is the cleansing functionality and any type of UI on the uh, data model side. Because as I said, most customers say, hey, we're not interested in this, just take the data as it comes and then we'll use our analytics tools uh, working on this. Uh, but we can see it coming that um, people want more from this. So making it easier, maybe with a little user interface instead of uh, having to play with SQL to um, cleansing the data or, or match it, merge it, uh, different data streams and so on. Um, so far, we have used a very simple uh, viewer here with uh, chart.js. Um, we're thinking about using more sophisticated stuff, but then again, our customers say, hey, don't spend too much time on this. Uh, if a doctor wants to look at the data, they would probably go to their uh, monitoring system and do it there if the data is still available. Sometimes they keep it only for two months or so. so that's something we might want to do. And um, one thing that's uh, very important for us is we, we need to evaluate this with real world data. So we're working with our customers in Germany. Um, so once they started ingesting and storing this data, we can actually work with them to, on, on analytics cases and see what's, what's good, what works, what does not. So what I was hoping for is uh, from, of course, also your ideas here in the, uh, in the audience. And with that, I would like to open the Q&A. Thank you very much. Any questions? Any ideas? So the question is, um, if we need more resources, then just have to buy bigger servers, basically. <laughs> of course, yes. Yeah. I mean, of course, we're, um, yeah. normally we would see final results that get fed over into a share. So if we're starting to collect raw data, then the, the amount of data that we need to store and process, of course, gets more and more. So then if there is a, a more storage requirements, in time, then oh, well, I guess you have to buy more hard disk space. Cloud, cloud that totally depends on the capabilities and the requirements. It could be both. Yeah. Sorry, I'm, I'm great. 
Um, I don't know if you've had occasion to speak with the Middle East team and the data that they're working with from Capsule, the medical device interface, because that has quite a bit of code that passes through and we only get a limited subset through track care. Um, we've been talking with a couple of international customers, but uh, not yet from the Middle East, I think. Yeah. But Capsule comes to mind, of course, as yeah. one of the vendors collecting uh, device data and so on. Yeah. There's another question over here. Michael, thanks for your presentation. It was really interesting. Um, so this was in the context of an acute care like in a, in a lab or point of care devices in a hospital setting. What about, have you, have you come across like real use cases, examples, projects with wearable devices out in the wild, as it were? Well, actually, uh, we've been on a large trade show in Germany a couple of weeks ago and worked with, an, uh, with a partner of ours who is um, selling uh, medical devices for home use. So uh, patient sees a doctor, doctor says, hey, use this and measure your blood pressure every two hours, whatever. And then it gets sent over to the cloud of that vendor and we have integrated with that in HealthShare and uh, fed the data in. Um, that's not a real world use case for us because we were just starting working with them, but it worked quite nicely. So they had their own cloud to store these data. I think it was some, some sort of fire format, some fire profile. And then we pulled it from their servers into HealthShare um, just for viewing on the, on the trade show, but of course we can uh, also integrate this with this solution here. And apparently this seems to be a market because they are selling their devices. So, and uh, they don't have the capability of um, linking it to real patients. So there's always this process, you know, if, you, if your doctor gives you a device that you wear like overnight, for instance, then uh, there's a little thumb drive in that. So when you bring the device back, they pull out the, the thumb drive, put it in the computer, attach it to your patient record as a manual process, basically. And uh, we're working with them how we can uh, overlay this maybe a little bit with the patient data we might already have in HealthShare so that process becomes a little bit easier. And that's also something that we could do with that solution, of course. Curious, is there any use case for taking slices of the time series data that's come up? In other words, I've got a continuous stream over an interval of time, but this small window is of interest. Let's save that separately as a separate subset or smaller, uh, re longer termed retained series of information to go with the patient record. Applied a drug, here was the 20 minutes after kind of thing. Um, that would go in towards, a little bit towards the direction of time series analytics or complex event processing. So um, right now we're focusing on ingesting the data as it comes in. And if we were to run it through a complex event processing engine, for instance, then we could trigger or we could uh, be triggered by certain events and then say, hey, uh, take the uh, new event that we found and make another time series of that. And of course, the data that's in HealthShare itself uh, I would consider that as a very slow time series. So if you see medications given by the doctor, maybe uh, one today, one next week, one next month, you know, that's also, that's just three data points, but it's also some sort of time series. And uh, the, the nice thing is here, I think we can combine this by providing both, one from iris for health one from HealthShare, over to some uh, analytics tools that can handle this. Now, unfortunately, traditional analytics, as I said, um, it might be not, not might not be the best tool for this. So if you have sliding windows using SQL or using Health Insight, for instance, that's not so easy, I would say. But the option is there, of course. We haven't done it yet, though. Just one more. Uh, I have a quick question. Uh, have you seen any use cases uh, for this being a great solution to address alert fatigue? Because many of these devices, as you know, they trigger many alerts in the healthcare system. Um, is this have you seen any use cases come up for, to address that? For alerting? Alert fatigue, yes. Yeah, that's, that's kind of an issue because then we're entering the area of medical device regulations. Mm -hmm. um, so that would be depending on how we implement the, uh, the real time part of it. So the part that resides in uh, iris for health Technically possible, of course. Um, if there is extra requirements with respect to medical uh, device regulations, then these need to be addressed. But we haven't done that so far. And one of the reasons is actually that um, 
the whole thing was triggered by research, uh, research requirements from large university hospitals in Germany. So they're not, um, they do not care so much about real time values, they just want the data. Uh, one thing that came up though was um, we could actually replay it. So if you had a complex event processing that would actually look at orders and distances and stuff like that, then it wouldn't make much sense to just send a bulk over so and then have it processing that we could actually replay this. Uh, at this moment, this is just a thought. So it, I think it would be possible, but we haven't done it. Anything else? Well then, I'm here. Um, if you have any questions, let me know. Or send me an email, you'll find these in the slides. And thank you for your attention.